Welcome to Advanced TV Herstory. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. This is the place where we connect the dots of TV and feminism to American culture and politics. If you like what you hear, head to tvherstory.com and listen into all of our archives that are categorized to make it easier to find what you're looking for. And also, while you're there, please sign up for our newsletter. Promise I'll never sell your information. Now, on with the show. Hey, everybody. Spring has sprung. And while we are approaching Mother's Day, I'm just going to say right off, I'm all in favor of rebranding Mother's Day to be Nurturer's Day. It's a low-key way to remove the biology from a relationship that can be powerful and nurturing and filled with love, but has nothing to do with the person who went to a hospital and actually created you. So today I'm going to be talking about a story of actually many women who came together to foster and surrogate, small s surrogate, a woman who became an actor, Victoria Rowell. And they were in the foster system in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And there's no way that I can do this book that Victoria wrote, Justice. But I want to tell you, we're going to explore kind of what it means to be a nurturer and not necessarily a mother. So the book I leave you to read, it's her 2007 memoir, The Women Who Raised Me by Victoria Rowell. Here we go. Since starting Advanced TV History, you know, as well as I do, I consume 30 to 40 memoirs and biographies and autobiographies annually, and some are better than others, no question. And in the case of some first firsthand first-person accounts, some are more reflective. They're self-aware, they're honest, they reveal. They are indicative of what a high school English teacher might say provides evidence of critical thinking. So first, I'll give you a bit about Rowell's book, The Women Who Raised Me. It's really good. And then I'll give you some insights into how Rowell, how her deep introspective work rattled some cages in 2015 and 2016. And then I will close out this episode with a bit of a challenge. You may know Victoria Rowell from her daytime drama award-winning presence, 818 episodes on The Young and the Restless as Drusilla Winters. She was on TV from 1990 to the late 2010s. From 1993 to 2001, she also was in primetime as Amanda Bentley Livingston in Diagnosis Murder. Diagnosis Murder starred Dick Van Dyke. She was a television success who had actually studied and trained her whole life to become a ballerina. Now today, 2024, Raul is an advocate for mental health awareness and treatment and support situations that often cause families to break apart. And she's also still an actor and a producer and a writer. But that whole notion of families and mental health and unstable situation causing families to break apart, that's exactly how she began her book, revealing the squalid conditions that child protection workers found her siblings in at the very moment that her mother was delivering her in a hospital in Maine. Now, immediately upon Raoul's birth, she was separated from her mother and after a longer than usual hospital stay was placed with a foster family, the first of many. In loving and vivid detail, Raoul tells her story of the caring, strong women, that's these women here on the bottom, who cared for her. Bertha, who was tag teamed by Laura. Later, she was a part of Agatha's family, the longest, for the longest period of time. And it was Agatha who nurtured the ballerina in Victoria. For many years, Victoria was on scholarships at ballet schools, and she stayed with extended family and through it all complied with the rules that govern one's existence when one is a ward of the state, which is what she was. Adoption? Hmm. The state of Maine had removed Victoria's mother, Dorothy, from her daily life, but Dorothy managed to stay in contact with all of these different women and sort of created enough of a bond to discourage everyone involved from adopting Victoria and her two sisters permanently. Then there was Esther, who entered Victoria's life via the Cambridge, Massachusetts School of Ballet. There was Sylvia, the mom of a good friend, and Rosa and Barbara, who nurtured Victoria as a young adult. Paulina and Carol were elder stateswomen of the prestigious ballet circle that Victoria had entered. All of these women took her and helped her navigate the world, as one does when one doesn't have immediate family and family support. Victoria tells her story while even weaving in the wisdom and the tenacity of her caseworker, who she eventually caught up with when she was researching this book. Rowell does more than paint her story that is filled with colorful and loving characters. She schools you on Maine state history, 
the foster care system of the 1960s and 70s and how how to see people for who they are, not their possessions or their home or their station in life. So listeners, somewhere around the 100th page, it really struck me, first of all, that this book was not what I expected it to be. And secondly, just how privileged my upbringing had been in the context of someone who is just a bit older than I, it was quite palpable and stirred me. Raoul writes from a memory that is fortified with scrapbooks that she and Agatha kept of her accomplishments and important events. And she also says that years of therapy helped open up memories that had been long buried, deeply suppressed. She had to separate to survive. Her shift from ballet to acting was based on the practical aspects of finances and age. She only knew stability once cast as Drusilla on Young and the Restless at the age of 30. Since that time, and since writing this book, she's also made headlines over the years for her involvement in foster adoption and mental health issues, and has actually even testified at various levels of policymaking. Because it helps put into context, there's another part of Victoria Rowell's life that it doesn't take much to find out, but I find it fascinating, and I find it very much connected to her book and her growing up experience needing to advocate for herself. In 2015, Victoria Rowell sued CBS and Sony for racial discrimination. She had auditioned very strongly, she felt, for a then-struggling Days of Our Lives. Now, remember, in 2015, there were not many daytime series left. Of that very sparse number, Days of Our Lives was at the bottom, and she felt she brought a very strong fan base and presence in the daytime world to Days of Our Lives. But she was informed that she wasn't a good fit. She kind of had evidence from all those years on Young and the Restless that systemic racism within CBS was alive and well. She knew how the system worked and she called it out. So if if you're curious about this, I encourage you to Google Victoria Rowell and Lawsuit and CBS, and you will find articles and video of her recounting the racist bullying behavior that actually came from some of her Young and the Restless co-stars. Through the litigation process, her claim was dismissed, but then it was resurrected on appeal. Two years later, the matter had been settled out of court and there was no monetary payoff. So I think to myself, wow, here it is, you know, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2015, and the level of racism that is subtle and just many, many hundreds of slights in the course of a year had led her to do something significant, which was going to have an impact on her and her career. And I raise this not because of the money that obviously did not change hands, but rather that she was functioning on a matter of principle and courage and conviction that had been part of her lifelong experience as a woman of color. And so she went after CBS and Sony. In 2015, when she initially filed the lawsuit, Les Moonves was still in charge at CBS, but not for long. In the wake of his scandal-ridden departure from CBS, we learned that he kneecapped careers of many women, both in front of and behind the camera, including successful and popular showrunner Linda Bloodworth Thomason, who created Designing Women and Evening Shade. I did a podcast episode about her open letter printed in The Hollywood Reporter to everyone about how Les Moonves had destroyed her career. My takeaway from that one podcast episode is that because he kneecapped her, and basically rode her out of town, we lost all of her potential as a showrunner, as a mentor, as a scout of new fresh talent, of writers and directors and crew and camera. So it was before Les Moonves was himself dismissed from CBS that Victoria had filed the lawsuit against CBS and Sony, calling them on the carpet top to bottom, that there was perpetuated racism within the entire network, daytime and primetime. So listeners, there just aren't too many people in Hollywood who do that these days. That is not a case of crying wolf, because the risk is truly to one's career and one's future. If she hadn't already been labeled difficult to work with, she undoubtedly would be now. And all of the allegations in these claims that are made, particularly in a visible industry such as the entertainment world, they are very rarely false. You don't make this stuff up and then put your head into the wind to be pounded like this. So. I say this only because going back to Victoria Rowell's courage and conviction, this comes from someone who has searched her soul and her life to find the good and to accept people for who they are and to advocate for those who have less than she does now. 
by taking no money in the settlement, at least on the surface, it seems to me she agreed to end the matter, getting something in return that was more important than money. Perhaps it was a promise of change at the network. As it will never likely be made public, we will never know. But that doesn't prevent us from wondering. As I reflected on her message, I struggled to list the women in my life who I would consider as having helped raise me and mold me to be the independent advocate that I am today. So I I kind of tweaked the word raised, and I came up with a list. And some of them are alive, and those who are still with me, I need to do a better job of reminding them just how important they are to me. And after that, I then began to wonder whether there are people, apart from my own grown children, who think of me as having helped raise them. And since I can't know that for sure, I can only strive to help young people even more, because goodness knows this chaotic world has never been more brutal. This clip is from a 2012 speech by Victoria Rowell. Be kind. A simple act of kindness to another person could save their life. Just a simple act of kindness and then pass it forward, because this is tough, and these are tough times. People are struggling. We've got grandparents raising a second generation of children because of a whole myriad of reasons, including drug addiction and mental health and a whole host of things, spending their retirement, trying to put grandchildren through college, You've got foster youth among you. You may not know it. You have children that are dealing with domestic violence and don't know what's going on in their families. You've got kids that are hanging on by a piece of dental floss to stay here. But you don't know that. You've got kids that don't go anywhere at Thanksgiving and Christmas because they have no place to go. And so they get as quiet as a church mouse and stay in a corner in their room hoping that the janitor doesn't find them. Because this is home. So be kind to each other, even if the person that is next to you isn't kind to you. Try to forgive them. Pray them up. Our music, as always, is Take Me Higher by Jazzer, and it's found at freemusicarchive.org. Audio editor Mary Lou Morose brings you the best possible audio experience, and video editor Nivia Lopez makes it suitable for viewing. I'm grateful they are on my team. With our many gifts and life experiences, we all have the power to nurture and love. And that is why I podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams.